Uh, greetings everyone, I'm Larry Williams and I'm the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our CARMA Consortium webcast panel session on this March 21st of 2008. Uh, the panelists that you were about to meet, you were about to meet, uh, will be giving one hour lectures later on this afternoon on research methods topics as part of our consortium webcast program. With this consortium webcast program, uh, universities and organizations from throughout the world uh, can join and during the year they have access to recordings uh, to live webcasts of 10 lectures as well as recordings of over 30 lectures and uh, our panelists that are here to, this morning to share some of their perspective on their involvement with research methods uh, and their careers. Uh, in addition to the consortium webcast program, we also have a summer short course program and we'll provide information at the end of this recording uh, about karma and about these programs. So what I've done for today's panel session is ask our panelists to consider several questions related to their history or involvement with the area of research methods and statistics, as well as their careers. So it's my pleasure to introduce, on the far left, Dr. Don Berg from the University of Denver. In the middle, Dr. Paul Sackett from the University of Minnesota. And next to me, Dr. Paul Bleasy from Walter Reed Army Institute. And Don, you have notes, we're going to assign the first question to you. <laughs> and uh, this first question is, Don, how did you get interested in research methods and statistics? I always wanted to understand better things that interested me. And I wanted to be able to do it myself. And uh, it just seemed to make sense to learn how to do it well. Okay. Paul, how about you? Well, I'm going to tell a very different kind of story. I have to tell a story on myself, which is a little embarrassing, but, but forgive me. Um, I was a college sophomore taking a, a psychology major, taking the course in uh, psychological testing and measurement, which was getting into measurement issues, and I was finding that pretty interesting. At the same time, I was taking a two-credit introduction to Fortran programming course. I'm not sure why I got advised to take it, but I did. One day, the psych department chairman who's teaching me this uh, psych testing course is giving someone a campus tour and wanders into the, the, the computer lab and sees me punching punch cards, this is 1976, uh, and expressed his surprise that I knew some, anything about computing, and thought nothing of this. Several months later, it's summer, I hold the worst job known to man. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, this is a Milwaukee job. My job is to take rusted out beer barrels and sandblast the rust off them. So this is hot, it's miserable, it's the worst job. You have to understand how bad that job is to forgive me for what comes next. My phone rings at home one evening and it's the psych department chairman saying, I remember seeing you in the computer lab. You know anything, you know something about computers. I'm looking for somebody who can do some, some, some programming for me. Can you run a factor analysis? I'm a college sophomore, I've never heard the word. I don't like sandblasting, and so I say, sure. He says, fair match rotation? Well, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. I said, well, okay, yeah. I could. And I got hired based on that very lousy interview. I rushed off to the library to learn this good stuff. And frankly, the, the opportunity that came my way got me into this whole thing. So it's one of these strange little, little events that had a big effect on an eventual career. Okay. Uh, Paul, how about yourself? Well, you know, my own experience doesn't, you know, have anything to do with lying and deception on an interview. <laughs> but uh, ironically, it was almost the opposite, which was that an undergraduate, I really hated statistics. I took statistics courses, and I thought, I can't imagine anybody ever doing this. But I liked computers, so I liked programming. I took programming classes. And then when I got to graduate school, I had a, you know, an excellent, just an introductory site course that did a lot of integration with uh, the computers, and I thought, wow, this is really neat. I can see how you could actually use this uh, programming skills, you know, to do the statistics, and it all fit together there. But in undergraduate, I never would have expected you know, that I would end up having a career doing a lot of methods work. Um, well, how about we go to the second question that I've asked our panelists to consider is whether they have a favorite statistics 
or methods course that they took while a graduate student, and if so, why that particular one? So since you were just talking about the statistics course, do you have a response to that? Sure, actually, and it just builds up exactly what I said on the first part, which was that you know, this was the very basic leveling stats class. We covered things like regression, you know, ANOVA, nothing simple, you know, median, mean. But it's just that the professor who taught it in that introductory graduate level course did a wonderful job. And that's where I realized that, you know, when you have somebody who knows the material well, likes the material, and can convey a sense of how this stuff will be useful, what he did is he used a lot of examples so that uh, the students could see, oh, I get it. I get why you use this technique. I can see the problem with the application of it. So that was the most influential course. It's just a leveling stats course to make sure all the undergraduates who were in graduate school had some basic level of understanding. And then from there, I enjoyed the other courses that went on. Okay. Paul, do you have a particular favorite statistics or methods course that you took while a grad student? I think a very similar story. I was grad student at Ohio State, and uh, the instructor is, is Robert McCallum, now at uh, University of North Carolina, who, um, so this is the basic correlation regression psychometrics uh, course, and it, he was just a model of clarity. Um, I find myself uh, today, 30 years later, that little spiral notebook from that course comes off my shelf on average once a week. Once a week for the last 30 years, I've pulled that thing off to look up something, to check on something that was just done so well, so clearly it was the foundation. And I really think that's the key, just to get absolute mastery of the foundations of measurement and what kind of one needs. So I am so grateful to Glenn McCallum for what did for me. Uh, Don, how about you? Similar story. Similar story. An influential first instructor that I had a research assistant job much like Paul's, where it was the punch cards and carrying boxes of punch cards over to a building to have them processed. One day I was carrying them and I got knocked down by a, a bicyclist and his cards blew everywhere <laughs> against the side of a wall. Thankfully, we had these old tricks where you take a box of cards and run a marker from one end to the other so you could sort them back in the right order. There was something magical about being able to take a box of punch cards. And you should be glad for those of you who haven't had to do this. <laughs> but to be able to feed them through a reader and you sit there for a minute, you wait to hear the printer go, and you're sitting in the chair, and all of a sudden that thing starts whirring and growing, and you go over there, and by magic, there are these statistics, these you know, mean comparisons, very basic issues like the gentlemen are mentioning, that really whet my appetite for it. So you learn about this in class, and then actually doing it and seeing how it works. So this was in the 80s, well before we had kind of the starts of systems now. But it was just, there is a an excitement and an interest about being able to take all sorts of data like this and make sense of it. That's what really got me going. Um, next question, uh, and Paul, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, as best you can recall, were there any particular challenges you faced in learning about statistics and research methods as a graduate student? Um, the, the, the quantitative program at Ohio State, which was my minor. Uh, emphasized derivations and proofs and you really had to get under the hood um, and so you knew that you eventually had to take a, a qualifying exam the, the nature of which was you're sat down in a room and you're told to derive this prove that uh, and I just invested so many hours in learning every trick of matrix algebra and uh, I was so smart then I don't know what's happened to me I could, I sure could do an awful lot of stuff back in the day, but yeah, that really was a challenge, and that was really, really tough. But I, I appreciate that it was not simply, uh, you know, here's how you interpret a piece of output, but it was understand how it works. Yeah, Don, how about you? Much the same story. Uh, for me, there was always a gap between the matrix algebra that you're talking about, deriving a, a figure, and then trying to make sense of it. So the, the gap between application and the math in the classroom was always difficult. My wife took a class from the late Clifford Clogg at Penn State. And Cliff was one of those people that spoke in math. He spoke in matrix algebra. And you might be able to follow his reasoning, but then trying to extrapolate that for the bigger world was always a challenge. That was, there was a gap in theory and practice. And trying to bridge that gap was always a good challenge. Okay. Well, well, I guess I had a kind of different answer to this one, but 
You know, my advice on this one would be just trust yourself. What I ran into in graduate school was that, you know, statistics was scary to a lot of the students. And so a lot of them would make it harder than it really is. And so I remember, you know, the worst performance that I did on exams sometimes was going around and hanging out with the other graduate students who got really spun up about things, and they really shook my confidence in it. So my advice to people would always be, you know, if you think that you know it, you probably do know it, and don't make it harder than it is. And that was uh, just one of the experiences that I had. Okay. Uh, all of our panelists have uh, considerable experience uh, in the review process and in, in at serving as action editor for research methods and statistics papers. Uh, so I'd like uh, you to comment on whether you know or see uh, frequent limitations or shortcomings of the papers that you review that our audience might be interested in. Uh, Don, you want to go first? Certainly. Uh, I would say three or four. Uh, one of the most common problems I have seen and continue to see is uh, with research design. Uh, we may focus on analysis or measurement issues, but if we have problems with our design to begin with, there may be built-in biases in the data, and no matter what you do with measurement or analysis, the challenges are, are significant. Other ones include recognizing assumptions uh, in analysis, uh, whether or not we, for example, within mediation, moderation, very straightforward elementary issues, whether or not we're even acknowledging correlations among measures, whether designs are properly structured to, to, to uh, distinguish between such effects. And, and those types of very basic issues, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but design, uh, measurement, also more specifically not examining the test of construct validation. Uh, I'm really surprised we give reliability statistics perhaps because they're easy to compute in some measures, but I don't see nearly enough attention to, to validity. So I'd say those three areas. Okay, Paul, how about you? Oh, I don't know. I thought about this question. Larry prepped us last night to give us a copy of the questions beforehand. And I really couldn't come up with uh, you know, something that I consistently see. I mean, sometimes I see that uh, individuals kind of throw the whole kitchen sink at a paper. And, you know, that is, uh, when you're reviewing, that can actually detract from it. And sometimes I see people write the paper. And instead of keeping it focused, they'll throw in, say, two or three more dependent variables. But in the end, I'm sure that they're doing that because they think it makes the paper stronger. But my advice on a lot of these papers would be, in many times, less is more. And that is that it's not always to your advantage to be so comprehensive, to put in you know, two or three extra dependent variables because they might be interesting or they might partially support it. Sometimes you know, the best papers are the ones that are clear and don't put in the additional stuff. It's been something I've consistently seen. Okay. Paul? I think what I'll say ends up echoing what Don said. Um, when I first became a, a, a journal editor, uh, it didn't take too long to realize, to my great disappointment, that the vast majority of papers that we rejected could have been rejected before the data was collected. Um, rarely is the fatal flaw what you do once you've got the data, the way you handle your data, the way you analyze it. And so it's these issues of, is it an interesting question? Is, it a, a, is, is your setup right such that logically you can draw the conclusions you, you would like to, to draw? And you know, have you conceptualized and operationalized your, your measures in a way that makes sense? So the strange thing is I look at graduate curricula, my own included, and the students will take course after course on what to do once you've got the data. You know, our students get a separate course in SEM, a course in HLM, a course in this, that, and the other. They can line up seven, eight, nine, ten stat courses, and, and here's all these things that happen before you've got your data that are so crucial. So it's, we've got to find ways to give more emphasis to the you know, fundamental logic of research. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, how about we start with you? Uh, the question is, do you have a favorite research methods or statistics book that either influenced you greatly or of which you rely upon regularly? Uh, that one's pretty easy, but the Cohen and Cohen 1983 is one that I go back to all the time, is the applied regression analysis. And, uh, you know, recent years I've done a lot more with longitudinal data, so I get a lot of use out of the Singer and Willett 
think it's 2003, mm -hmm. and a book on the longitudinal analysis as well. But those are probably the two that I reference the most. Okay, Paul, how about you? I'll tweak this. It's not what I reference the most, but it's one that I going to encourage people to take a look at. One of the most marvelous books that I know is Robert Abelson's Statistics as Principled Argument. I don't know if people know this book. It is not a stat book in the sense it doesn't teach you methods per se, it doesn't give you formulas. It's the concept, it's thinking about research. It's about, yeah, again, statistics as argument. You are, you are using data analytic tools to advance an argument, and it is profound, and it is funny. It has great, uh, my favorite chapter title, uh, my favorite chapter is the title, ties the chapter title, Unsuspecting Fishiness. <laughs> so if you look at somebody's work and say, something doesn't seem to be right here. Now, nobody talks about that, and here's an entire chapter. Uh, there's a chapter about um, to the, way, to the style with which you present research. He characterizes the two extremes as brash versus stuffy. You know, do you go for the one-tailed test, or do you insist on this and that? The many, many, many different choices that characterize being pretty aggressive and how far you're willing to stretch things versus by the book. Um, Robert Abelson, Statistics as Principal Doctor. I'll give a big thumbs up to that one, too. It's a fantastic book. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Did we get you on that one? No. Uh, but Don, go ahead. Uh, in terms of references, I used two. Uh, one is Vogue's Dictionary of Statistics, 1993 Sage, because as a reviewer, as an editor, I'm seeing so many different types of approaches come along. It may be a function of age, too. But I start forgetting what some of these terms mean. And it's nice to be able to pull a dictionary off the shelf and be able to look up what something is. I mean, it's just, it sounds silly, but uh, I use that book at least once a week. And also, uh, Cook and Campbell, Campbell and Stanley, as I mentioned earlier, the design readings, I think, are very important. Whenever I'm reviewing a paper, I try to code the design, and then I usually look it up to see uh, if they did it right or what the issues are. And uh, I use that with my own research as well. So it's Campbell and Kenley, Campbell and Stanley, Cook and Campbell, that whole series that they did. Okay. Uh, the next question, we'll start with you again, Paul. From a big picture perspective, are there topical areas within the fields of research methods or statistics that you think we are doing a particularly good or particularly bad job of investigating? You know, I suspect everybody's answer to this question would be, you know, biased by what they're looking at you know, at the particular time. In my case, uh, I've become interested in, you know, how we uh, evaluate interventions. And interventions could be going into an organization and implementing, you know, a new HR practice. In the military, it could be <coughs> randomly assigning people to different conditions and actually seeing months later whether that random assignment of the individuals to this condition makes an impact. And it's so, it's the implementing effects of, you know, experimental design, if you will, in the applied setting. But as a reviewer and reader of the articles, I see very few of these, at least in a lot of organizational psychology. And they're extremely challenging, you know, in organizations. So, but I think as a science, it's important for us to think about, you know, how do we assign individuals and or groups to random conditions to do something to one set of individuals, not to another and then to evaluate it further on. I think we need to do that much more than relying on correlational data. Big challenge, but I think there's a lot of payoff in that. Paul? I think I made a sheet on this question. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about a topic area, but uh, one, of, one of the things that I worry about is that while we are getting, we're getting very, very sophisticated, uh, Every year, there's there's more and fancier. And for those of us who are into the methods, this is really neat and this is really intriguing. Um, but I'm a methodologist second. I'm a psychologist first. I'm an organizational psychologist. Uh, my profession is made up of uh, maybe 25 to 30 percent people in academic research settings and 70 percent people trying to work in organizational settings. And, and so I'm very interested in making sure that the research work we do is readable and accessible and understandable to broader audiences than the relatively small subset of us who work very hard to stay current with, with methods. And 
Sophia knock us on things we do a bad job is I think we sometimes are happy talking to one another and, and don't do a very good job of describing things in a way that, and yes, we're using some fancy techniques, but I'm going to make sure that I, that, that anybody with a basic background can read and understand the gist of it. I'm not sure how we solve that one, but that's what I worry about a lot. Don? Yeah, I would build on that. I think in terms of positives, we're doing a very good job of uh, learning these new methods, uh, linear growth modeling, HLM, as you've mentioned. But in the macro area where I'm at, in terms of business policy and strategy, we, we see less application of these sophisticated methods. So in the derivation of what Paul said is the, these advances that are occurring in psychology and such um, are being slow to be accepted in strategy. And I think we don't do as good of a job talking across the divisions as I wish that we did, to be frank. And we have been much slower to adopt some of these new methods, I've heard of people being resistant to trying some of these new analytical methods. I've seen surveys come out where reviewers and strategy aren't familiar with some of these uh, as well. So I think that there's been some um, barriers, and I'm not sure what they are, that exist across the divisions. Because I see significant differences in terms of what's being used in psychology and what's being used in strategy, and whether that's due to age or other areas I'm not Sure, but I think that's been a problem for us. Okay, and our final question uh, Do you have any career advice that you would like to offer to aspiring methodologists? And Paul, maybe we'll have you start with this one. Um, I guess this, this is tough. I guess what I would say is um, find every opportunity you can as early as you can to teach methodology. Um, for me, there's no better way to figure out if you really know something than to have to try to explain it to somebody else. Um, so for me, the first time I try to teach something is, is the moment that really pushes me forward in my, in my understanding. Um, so that's one little thing. I guess that's the point I'll make here. Okay, Don, how about you? Yeah, I would go a little bit more earlier than that, and I would say read the classics so you learn what it is you're teaching to. Uh, so for example, if we're talking about a company in a class, it helps to read the history of the company and know about the company. So to me, I suggest starting off by reading the classics. And along those lines, uh, learning how to do multi-method types of research, learning how to interview, learning how to do casework, as a, in addition to larger scale empirical work being Castle on both sides of that, so you really do understand the topic that you're talking about. Taking a methods course every semester, if you possibly can, whether it's design, and I strongly suggest design classes, in addition to analysis classes. Paul? I would just uh, actually build off, you know, Paul's uh, earlier statement, not the answer to this question, but where the one where he jumped right in, you could do a factor analysis. Don't be afraid to go out and try these new things. If you have a chance, if there's something, an opportunity comes your way, you may not know it, but you know, trust yourself, trust your ability to figure it out, jump in and you know, work through these things. And if you take these challenges and embrace them, you know, you'll continue to learn in the area. I recently had uh, someone who asked me if I'd ever done a propensity score analysis. I had no idea what it was. But you know, read the literature, jumped into it, and you know, figured it out. It was a fantastic area. So no matter how far along you are in your career, there will always be these new things that you can jump into and get involved with. Okay. Uh, Don, Paul, and Paul, thank you so much for sharing uh, your thoughts and reactions to these questions. Uh, again, I invite you to visit the Karma website and uh, you'll get more information about our Karma Consortium webcast program and our Karma short courses. Thank you.